When I was 15, I went to a school that was based on Summerhill in England, which is a, a free school where there are no classes. Most of the pe students had, were thrown out of normal schools. We ran around naked and we had sex and we learned social skills. And I immediately became obsessed with taking pictures. So I became pretty much the school photographer. My first subject was David Armstrong, who's still my best friend some 30 years later. David had started to do drag as a, he was dressing as a woman. He looked like a woman anyway. And through him, I met a whole community of drag queens. So about eight months out of school, I started living with these drag queens. This was the early 70s in Boston. At this time, the queens couldn't work. They couldn't go out during the daytime. So we lived a nocturnal existence. And we went to the same bar the other side every single night. And I was the, I was the bar photographer. The bar was run by the mafia, but they liked me and they let me photograph all the time. And, um, and I took the pictures to the drugstore. I didn't have a dark room. So they came back as little snapshots, and then the queens would make piles um, to see who had the most pictures of them. And my work was all about homage, because I thought they were the most beautiful people I'd ever met in my life. I knew from a very early age that what I saw on television had nothing to do with real life, so I wanted to make a record of real life. And that psychological need included having my camera with me all times and recording every aspect of my life and the life of my friends. So the camera functioned partially as my memory. Cookie was uh, one of my best friends of my whole life. We were a family and there was no distinction between gay and straight. Cookie and myself were both bisexual and um, really lived that. I mean, not just in theory, but in, in actuality. She was uh, the diva, the sort of superstar around which our whole family rotated. Uh, it was at her house that we had Thanksgiving where she would serve opium and turkey. We went to clubs every night. Um, everyone snorted heroin, but it was a party drug. It wasn't an addiction at that time. Sharon lived with Cookie for many years. We were constant companions. And when Cookie started sleeping with men, Sharon went through a crisis. I was the confidant of both of them. And then she went to Italy and met Vittorio Scarpati an Italian artist. And a few years later, he came to New York and they got married. And they were both HIV positive. But uh, by 1989, Vittorio died in September. And, and then after Vittorio died, Cookie had lost her voice and she could no longer speak. And this is the day that Vittorio died, and there was a visitation at the casket by all of us all day long. And then this is Cookie. By that time, she couldn't talk and she couldn't walk without a cane. And then after that, she kind of gave up. In the mid 80s, um, many of us became addicted to drugs, mostly to heroin and cocaine. And so the line between use and abuse was crossed. I got to the point with my addiction uh, where I didn't go out of the house for six months or so. I was doing an enormous amount of cocaine, about five to 10 bags of dope a day. And part of that at that time was being a cocaine addict. In 1988, I was in a drug rehab clinic for two months and then three months, I was in a halfway house and I started to photograph myself. 
and my own face in order to find out what I looked like without drugs and to fit back into my own skin. And so this is taken actually in the hospital. The crucifix was not part of the hospital. It was just a little milagre that I collected. Um, I'm Jewish, but I've always collected many things that, and some of them are Catholic art. And it was sort of my good luck sign. The name of the hospital is embossed on the um, pillowcase. So you can tell if you look closely that I'm in a hospital. And it was a period of a lot of fear and, and sort of crisis of identity. Nothing was familiar. So I had lived 15 years in utter darkness. I had never gone out during the day. So all of a sudden I was living in this light. And I didn't know at that time that light affected the color film. I sincerely didn't know that. So the work became all about light and the, both metaphorically and, and literally about coming out of darkness into light. And then a year and a half later, I was strong enough to move back to New York. And I was living with a young woman who had been my lover previously named Siobhan. And I photographed her every day. And that became almost a form of lovemaking. It was like a caress. And she would be hurt if I didn't photograph her. And that was part of getting to know how close I could get to another person without drugs. And this was the summer of 1990. We went to Provincetown. Provincetown is a gay resort on the very tip of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Nothing was set up. She was just dressed like that, and then she took her clothes off. This is what she was looking at me with at the time. This was the intimacy between us. This is the feeling that was between us. My work for years was about sexuality as an addiction. I'm not a sexual addict, but the idea that you could become sort of sexually addicted to somebody was inappropriate to you on many levels, emotionally, um, mentally, and why this need to couple is so strong. This is a famous series of pictures I did of myself and Brian having sex and then right after sex. These pictures were motivated because of pictures I had taken of other friends of mine having sex and then after sex. Brian was my boyfriend from 1981 till 1984 when he battered me and the relationship ended. I'm using a tripod and I have a cable release, but I didn't set the picture up. I had no idea what any of these pictures would look like until later after I saw them. I didn't prearrange it, I didn't draw it, I didn't envision it. I just photographed what actually happened and then I found this picture that I thought was very meaningful in sort of the ambivalence of my gaze and in the distance between us right after sex. The fact that he's turned away from me and smoking and I'm still looking at him for intimacy. And then the picture taken right afterwards in which we both look rather sad. I'm wearing a kimono that I had worn during the sex and we're both estranged and quiet and sort of sad. I feel that for many years I was mostly interested in photographing people's external behavior and their relationships and their sexuality and their gender identification. I think that um, my early work of drag queens was probably some of the work that most accepted drag queens as a third gender. I have many friends who live going between genders back and forth, and I think there are many varieties of gender. And I've been obsessed with that all along. Um, everything from drag queens to bodybuilders is about transformation of the self and the courage to manifest that.
This is Kim Harlow, a very famous transsexual in Paris, who was a very good friend of Gilles Dussain, who used to be my gallerist in Paris before he died. And he had known Kim since she was a little boy. When she grew up, she had a sex change, and she was considered one of the most beautiful women in Paris. And um, I was very, very attracted to her and found her incredibly beautiful and became friends with her. And she didn't want to meet any transsexual or transvestite friends of mine because she really felt that she was living as a woman and didn't want to be classified in that world. This is in the Carousel de Paris, where she was a performer. And I got permission to go backstage and photograph her and the other performers. And in this picture, I'm alone with her in the dressing room, and I'm telling her how beautiful she is. And she's looking right at me and covering her breasts in a very demure way, but very proud of her body and her beauty. And then I went to visit her, and she had lost a lot of weight. And I tried to speak to her about Gilles and the fact that Gilles was sick. And she said, I don't want to talk about AIDS. And two months later, she had died. She never told anybody that she had AIDS. We found out in the newspaper. The work w has always been misunderstood as being about a certain milieu of drugs and parties and the underground. And although I'd say that my family still is marginal and that we don't want to be part of normal society, I don't think the work was ever about that. I think the work has always been about um, the condition of being human, the pain, uh, the ability to survive and how difficult that is.